Welcome everybody to the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all for joining me today. I'd like to introduce our next keynote presentation here at the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event 2021. It's a good friend of mine who's been on my podcast, both the Planet Microcap and the Investors Roundtable many, many times. A good friend and colleague at this point. I hope we get to meet in person at some point in the next year or two, uh, but uh, I'm really excited to introduce to you Kelvin Sito. He's better known as at Slingshot Cap on Twitter, and he'll be doing a presentation today, as you see here, understanding microcaps and the importance of a good operator. And with that, Kelvin, take it away. All right. Hey, Robert. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to your event. So today, um, I just want to present on this topic called understanding microcaps and the importance of a good operator. So let's move on first, right? Um, so I just would like to say that the content that I am going to share is only made for educational purposes only. And I own shares. Uh, there'll be a couple of companies that I'm mentioning. Uh, but in particular, I actually own shares in Insight Distilling and Par Technology. And, you know, um, and I do not own shares in other companies that are being mentioned. And myself and my affiliates may buy any securities mentioned. And we stand to benefit financially if they rise in value. And lastly, you know, you should always seek independent financial and legal advice before making any financial decisions. All right, let's get into the topic of today, right? Uh, but before that, I'd like to introduce a little bit about myself. Um, so I grew up in Singapore, traveled quite a fair bit in Asia Pacific, and in the next few years, I do hope to visit uh, USA and Canada even more. I run a podcast called The Growth Investing Secrets too, and I run a fund in Singapore of separately managed accounts. So this is a bit of what I do uh, pre-COVID-19, uh, conduct uh, sharing sessions. Um, I, I do miss this quite a fair bit. And this is, was me in Singapore and Malaysia, where I think uh, we exchange good ideas with other investors, other business leaders. And on the right side, that's my podcast, all right? Called the Growth Investing Secrets. So, okay, first we've got to talk about the microcap advantage, right? Over here, you know, we'll see that microcaps do deliver higher returns than large caps over the long run. So on the right side, you'll see that on the average annual returns, uh, microcaps is growing at about 13.7%, whereas large caps is growing at 10.9%. So you see that the difference is not a lot, that's about 2.8%, uh, but compounded at 20 years, this 2.8% difference is huge for any investor. Then we got to ask ourselves if we really believe that microcaps are the ones that would compound our wealth uh, significantly. Then we got to ask ourselves, how do we identify good uh, microcaps? Because I think the biggest blanket statement that people would say about microcaps is that these are penny stocks, these are stocks that are very risky, but the truth, I think, is very far from the statement. So let's talk about it, right? First, wanting to identify multi-baggers in the microcap space, we've got to understand the reality first, right? In the space of Canada and United States, there are over 6,000, um, you know, roughly around 6,200 companies that are below uh, 400 million market cap right now. And within there, you know, only 219 companies compounded wealth significantly. So that's roughly about 3.6% uh, of the total universe. But, you know, we are not going to analyze um, every company out there. It does not make sense. Uh, you know, I believe success leaves clues and we need to have a framework. But today, you know, I will not talk so much about the business portion, but I do want to borrow this framework from Poland Capital. So we want a business as competitive advantage able to grow its margins, its profits, uh, have repeatable sales, and generate strong free cash flow, and earns high return on capital. And that's the ultimate goal, right? But today, you know, for my presentation, I'd like to bring a different flavor, which is my focus on the business operator, and bring across some of my experiences. So, but first, I want to differentiate to all of you what's the difference between micro caps and other uh, mid caps, large cap, uh, and even mega caps, right? So for smaller companies, uh, there are some uh, uh, very um, stark differences. For example, if you look at micro caps, um, the, the, the layers of management teams, um, it does not have many layers. Uh, many staff get to interact with the CEO directly, uh, but for large caps, you know, many staff actually speak to the media, media management, we call it the vice presidents, the C-suite as well. But at the same time, right, uh, we talk about execution risk of the operator. Since for micro caps, uh, the, the CEO tends to do a lot of different roles, take on different roles, such as doing technology, doing sales, um, there's more execution risk on the CEO of a micro cap. So most of the sales channels tend to come from the CEO himself, um, you know, or the technology or the marketing plan is drawn up by the CEO himself. But for bigger companies, um, the CEO usually have 
other management personnel to support him. But as was said, uh, share dilution, uh, micro caps, you know, tend to have a high possibility, especially when it's uh, cash burning. So we want to be very clear, right, that whenever we invest in micro caps, do we see a strong path to profitability? And lastly, you know, we talk a lot, talk about large, uh, mid mega caps. Uh, the share dilution is usually quite low because they are able to self finance their own operation. So today, I wish we should talk about more about the importance of a good operator. <coughs> so from my perspective, right, as investors, I think while it's true that we are investing in companies, the truth is on a deeper level, we are investing in people. You know, uh, a, a, a leader who's able to assemble a group of passionate people, right, driven by his or her passion of creating the best products to serve customers. What is his life story, right? What is his purpose behind starting the company? And how does he manage his team? And why are people compelled to join him? So all in all, at the end of the day, right, if you want to find great companies, we must first identify great people. And I believe that there are many analysts out there who are usually analyzing numbers. But what most analysts fail to do is, is to make this realization, this simple realization, numbers are created by people. So it is really important for us to understand how do we identify good operators and that will be the key to uh, finding a good company. So there are three qualities that I would like to explore with all of you uh, today. Uh, first is the skin in the game. Second is a great execution abilities. And thirdly is being a visionary. So, you know, this is really over the course of my stock picking work. I found these three characteristics to be particularly very particularly important to identify multi-baggers. So let's talk about the first thing, right? Skin in the game. So, you know, the management must be able to demonstrate clear actions to show that he's all in in the business. Uh, this could be maybe uh, buying stocks regularly, or um, I, I think maybe it's much more than that as well. Actually, it, it is the owner's mentality, aligning his salary with well-defined targets or making some personal sacrifices for the business, going the extra mile to make the company successful. So today I want to share with you uh, one company is called uh, Expel and the operator is called Ryan Pay. The amazing thing is that you know um, um, when the, when he first joined the company, the company had some uh, financial uh, concerns, and because of that, uh, Ryan, who's uh, the CEO, uh, came in and offered uh, to pay down the the borrowings using his personal credit card. You know, so the amazing thing is that he's not even the founder; he's a hired operator. So putting ourselves into his shoes, how many of us would do something like that? I think it's going to be very rare. So what does it tell us? That he's all in, that he's tied his personal credit worthiness to the success of this company. And he even goes to say in the last paragraph, I knew at that point that I would eventually get paid back by the company. I knew that we could do it. So this is one classic example that you can really see a very clear demonstration of a CEO being all in in the company. How about the next example, right? This guy called Selim. Um, what happened was he, he gave up a high-flying career at Primark and took a pay cut to join an unknown and not a well-known company. And this company is called Midabi. And the second thing that he did was to sell a house, uh, sell, sell a house that he had just built to buy a large stake in the business. So uh, what's even more uh, incredible is that this business, um, it was his dream house, right? And his father even came over to supervise the construction of this house. So once again, how many of you would do that, right? Um, I think not many. So usually when I analyze companies, I, I try to look for uh, some uh, signals to tell me whether the CEO is really fully on board, that is really fully committed to grow the company because you don't want a CEO that's just one foot in, you want a CEO that's all in to actually grow the business for you. So, you know, these are some really uh, exceptional cases, but, you know, we don't really expect uh, all the CEOs to use their credit cards to pay down the debt. We don't expect all CEOs to sell their houses, to buy a large uh, stake in the business. But this, I think, drives across the idea that, you know, having a management team, an operator, who have very strong skin in the game, uh, 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 a trade, you know, really shows how important it is to, to, to find a company that could be a multi-bagger. And the second thing that I want to share with all of you is this great execution abilities. And I think this is really important because it helps us to differentiate a good operator and a poor operator. <clears throat> um, there are a few signs of execution that I would always look at. Number one, uh, signing deals, partnership, onboarding new customers. <clears throat> second, continuous revenue growth, uh, profitable unit economics, um, 
able to gain market share. Thirdly, uh, product innovation, product category releases, and lastly, more quality talents joining the company. And I think uh, second point, right? We cannot neglect revenue growth. I think revenue growth is the validation of a company's uh, product market fit. And also you need new products to expand to new uh, uh, geographies. Uh, you need uh, new products to actually increase uh, the revenue size of your business, right? To ensure continuous growth. So I, I will also say that the last point I think is really important, uh, more quality talents joining the company. I think it's actually a very strong uh, telltale sign. Uh, if this business has no bright prospects, talents will not consider joining the company at all. I think talents, they are smart. They will do their own due diligence. And only if the company has a bright future, then they would consider. So usually when I see a micro cap being able to attract talents from bigger company, it really goes to show maybe something is actually happening within the company. Maybe the company have a good uh, prospects, right? So <clears throat> that's really important. And all in all, I would always ask myself on a quarterly basis as I'm assessing the business performance, I would ask myself, what are some of the achievements, right? If there's no achievements to talk about, uh, there's no um, acquisition of new customers, there's no new revenue growth, then I'll be wondering what is the CEO doing? You know, is he just collecting a pay? Uh, and I think a business must be growing and a business must be uh, growing intentionally and executing. So I want to bring across ex an example to all of you. Uh, this is a company called uh, uh, Liet. It's a micro cap uh, company. I believe it's somewhere around 100 million uh, market cap. And so this business itself, uh, they should produce uh, product, uh, productive equipment for uh, extreme sports. So you can see some of the photos uh, over here, the gloves, the helmets, uh, the boots, uh, the outerwear, and uh, even the neck brace as well, right? And the, and the knee guard as well. So I like to talk a little bit more by sharing with you and overlaying the share price chart of this uh, company. So as we track back, right, uh, we saw some execution. So number one, Quarter 1, 2021, revenue was up 24%, and they launched the mountain biking shoe line. Over here, the revenue was up uh, 32%, income was up 787%. Uh, over here, 17 August 2020, they launched the Aaron Chase 3.0 flat shoes. And quarter 3, uh, revenue once again is up, and they have launched new riding uh, gear as well. And over here, a quarter 4, 2021, awards for multiple products. So you would like a product um, to be award-winning, right? It shows that the industry recognizes the quality of this, uh, of, of the products. And, you know, I think quarter four, 2020, they have signed on multiple year uh, partnership with the Honda racing team, right? So at the end of the day, I think for any racing team, they would have done their due diligence. And the fact that they have chosen uh, Liet products really goes to show that the product uh, is of some quality, right? It's, it's a telltale sign as well. And quarter one, 2021, rev revenue was up once again. They redesigned their uh, helmet line and they are reinvesting cash for product development. So all in all, what can you see over here? You can see execution, right? Like clockwork. And I think for companies that have appreciated significantly, um, you know, over the last 10 years of my investing experiences, I've always seen that it's, it, it boils down to one thing, right? It's really great execution and great product. So if you have these two uh, ingredients, then I believe um, we are on track to finding something that would compound our wealth as well. Now, the next company that I like to talk about is uh, this company called Galaxy Gaming. So this taught um, Cravens. Um, so what I would always do uh, to assess execution abilities is to look at the press releases, right? Are they expanding to new places? Are they opening new outlets? depending on the nature of the businesses, um, have they uh, done any new collaboration, new partnership as well? But, you know, sometimes companies may not put out press releases. So what do you do? Um, I think uh, microcaps companies, they don't really get a lot of uh, CEOs. Uh, they, don't, they don't get a lot of uh, investors, shareholders uh, speaking to them. So, you know, uh, in most cases, when I try to talk to a microcap uh, CEO, uh, the chances is that I would usually be able to get him on the line. So once you get him on the line, what are some questions that you want to ask, right? Um, ask them, you know, what are the areas of product innovation? What are the new hires? How many new customers have you added as well? So you never know, but you might get good clues to where is the next growth phase as well. So maybe let, let, let's have an example, right? Maybe on average, they've added 15 customers for the last quarter. Um, um, and then, um, sorry, maybe on average, right? For the last year or so, they've added 15 customers. But then for the last quarter, they have added 25 customers. So you want to 
us, you want to dig deeper, right? What allowed them to grow uh, meaningfully? Um, and is, is this sustainable, right? Ask deeper questions about the business uh, instead of asking questions such as uh, your, what is your gross profit margin? What's your sales growth? I think all these are, are good questions, but as a microcap investor, you want to understand the business. You want to ask business-related questions. So um, if, if sometimes the management is a bit uh, uh, quiet, I would just ask, you know, what are some exciting developments that happened in the past quarter, all right? So this is really coming down to execution abilities. Uh, now to move on to um, um, something else, you know, I, I think for most uh, microcaps, the, the founders could be new to the business and some of the founders are also experienced. They are trying to learn. They're trying to build a business. They're trying to learn how to run a publicly listed company. So they are bound to make mistakes along the way. But for investors, some of us might not want to suffer and we might not want to pay for their mistakes. So is there a, a walk around? Is there a, a walk around, right? Well, I just want to share with you, the trick is very simple. Uh, find a company with a very experienced CEO, a CEO who have ran a bigger companies before. And so it provides you with some uh, experience, right? And, and, and guidance in terms of running the business. So what I will always say is that, um, you know, find management teams who are previously running bigger companies. So you get talents and the skill sets of an uh, experienced executive in a small cap or micro cap company. So I'd like to bring across this example to all of you. It's called uh, Eastside Distilling. Okay. So the CEO who, who uh, is running the company today is a seasoned consumer goods executive with more than three decades of experience. Um, spent, you know, basically three years of his life uh, building businesses. So also, right, look back at his uh, past companies and ask and, and find out what is the revenue size. So if you look at it, uh, he have joined uh, several companies uh, previously, right? Uh, Jacobs, Marison, uh, SVP Worldwide. And these are businesses from a range of 300 million uh, to 500 million revenue run rate. So over here, you can see very clearly, right? Um, he has the skill sets to manage a bigger business. So what are some reasons why he left his uh, companies and joined uh, Eastside? You know, a business that currently is generating less than 20 million in revenue. So there must be some compelling reasons. So all in all, what we have talked about is great execution abilities. Now, how to move on about move on about the last point is about being a visionary. I think uh, being a visionary is very important to visualize what the future needs and execute towards that vision, right? A CEO has to, be, uh, has to be ambitious so that he can create a vehicle for his team members to thrive. And I like this phrase from Wayne, right? He's a famous Canadian uh, hockey player. Skate where the puck is going, not where he has been. So, you know, you really want a CEO that's able to, to dream a little bit bigger, um, see the future and build the future. And that gets the team members excited. Um, and I think it really serves the customers as well. So there are a few things that we look at. Um, uh, what is their culture? What are the types of people they want to recruit through their products? What kind of valuable problems they're solving for their customers? What do they want to be known for? So that's really building a, a, a vision, right? So how are they addressing such questions? And I can say, um, usually when I look at a business that is a small cap, a micro cap, if they are able to articulate their vision uh, really clearly, it really shows that they actually know who they want to become, right? And I think there are very there are many benefits from having a clear vision, right? Number one, I think it improves recruitment efforts. Second, I think it attracts the right partnership, suppliers, customers to the ecosystem. And it, it provides a clear roadmap, most importantly, right? For investors to know where the business is heading. So if the operator is able to answer this very clearly, then you know that likelihood, you know, this business is moving towards a future, right? But if the operator is unable to answer what's their vision, then I think the possibility of it being a multi-bagger is, is somewhat uh, reduced in my opinion. Now, I want to share with you some examples as well. So, uh, Himaka is a company I used to uh, invest, but since then it has been uh, acquired. Uh, and what's Himaka's vision, right? It's to be epic center of cell therapy. Um, this, the operator said that, you know, he, he wants Himaka to support cell therapy from research to commercialization. And his dream is that cell companies, when they think about where they want going to source their raw materials, they think about Himaka first. So that's a very strong vision and that compels the whole company to, to, to move towards that future as well. And maybe uh, bring a mega cap company. Uh, back then, uh, Bill Gates, who was the CEO of Microsoft, said that a computer on every desk, in every home, running Microsoft software. So it is really important because um, uh, both visions are very easy and both management knows where they are heading. So today, 
you are investing in a micro cap, you are investing in, in, in an operator, right? And an operator is very important. Uh, they play a role to actually build the future for uh, their, their team members and also for investors as well. So I also want to share across a few examples. Uh, this is Insight. Um, they say that, you know, we don't want to be a $20 million company. We want to be a $200 million company. You have Pa, which say that, you know, he, you know, he wants to be the world's largest restaurant technology company. And finally, uh, Biotricity wants to be a billion dollar company. So this might come across as promotional. Uh, I, I do understand some concerns as well, but this also shows on the other side that they are very ambitious, right? They think bigger than where they are currently. So what I'm most afraid of whenever I'm investing in, in small caps or micro caps is that the CEOs or, or the operators, they do not dream big at all. So if the CEOs do not dream big, I think it is very hard for the business to build a platform to attract quality talents in. At the same time, uh, you know, as investors, you know, we need to do our quarterly due diligence to see whether they are on track, you know, like what we talk about, signing new deals, seeing revenue growth rates as well. Are they hiring the right people? Is the, is the growth on track, right? But I do want to caution as well, uh, sometimes creating a vision, having a huge addressable market is useless. And I think to some point is deceiving to investors unless a product has, you know, a company has differentiated products and services. The founders are able to execute. I think that's really important. So track them on a quarterly uh, basis. And finally, uh, there must be long-term incentives for all uh, employees involved, right? Be it stock options, salary, or bonuses. So one thing is this, uh, you can look at the DEF 14A, all right? That's a proxy statement um, and it shows how they are being incentivized. So I think um, when I look at such statements, right, like that 14A um, is an SEC, SEC filing, it really shows that if, it's, if the compensation is very detailed, it shows one thing. While they are a small company, they are behaving like a big company. It shows that they are serious and they put uh, good targets, revenue targets to unlock, you know, bonuses and stock options. And the last thing that I also look at is um, the board of directors as well, right? If they are able to attract um, talents to join their board of directors, it means something. Because for these uh, uh, independent directors, they do not join a company uh, simply because they want to make uh, director's fees, right? They don't just want to earn director's fees. They want to join a successful company. So when you see a micro cap, a small cap is able to attract very quality independent directors, uh, quality uh, team members, you know, it, it really goes to show that the business is heading towards the right direction. And these are the things I look at. So this is it, right? Three qualities to focus on. First thing is the skin in the game. Uh, you, you want to see there's a personal commitment on the operator side, an owner's mindset. Second is the great execution abilities, able to execute on customers, all right, and continuous revenue growth. And thirdly, I think it's just being ambitious enough and creating the vision, the vehicle that attracts uh, team members to join you to execute on it. But I do want to talk about uh, a side topic over here before we end uh, this presentation. Are uh, the red flags in the land of microcaps, right? So uh, I, I think uh, one thing that I tend to avoid is that if there are many quarters of cash burning, um, uh, let's say a, a, a company is loss making, uh, usually I'm okay with it. But if the, if the losses continue without any increase in revenue, right? I, I think it just leads to future dilution uh, through the placements of shares at discount. Because sometimes a business could be scaling up, uh, you know, so they, they might be uh, loss making. But if the revenue is growing quickly to a point, I see there's a path to profitability. I think that's all right. But if there's continuous cash burning without any increase in revenue, then um, that's not something that I would sign up for, right? And second, you know, if a, if a micro cap has very high share count, for example, uh, for, for, for a business that, that's 100 million in market cap, having more than 50 million in shares, it goes to show that maybe this business has a history of diluting shareholders and issuing shares. And that's not something that I want. Thirdly, I think if a, a operator or a CEO is being too promotional, uh, spending more time talking about the stock price instead of company performance, uh, I'll be quite uh, worried about it. So um, sometimes when I speak to the CEO, I would uh, kind of, you know, ask him, you know, what, what do you think of the share price? You know, then I would uh, try to assess how their responses are, you know. But those really good ones, uh, they will pull away my attention from the share price and then, you know, realign my focus back on the company performance. So this is a trick that I used to do uh, whenever I ask company, uh, CEOs uh, about the stock price. I'm actually trying to discern where their heart is. Is it on the stock price or is it on the company performance? And I think on the last point, right, 
uh, high compensation without performance targets, um, I, I think it is scary uh, because you're almost writing a blank check to the CEO. So everything really boils down to strong execution uh, towards a common uh, vision. And once again, if you have these three things uh, in line, um, I think the likelihood of you finding a multi-bagger, the likelihood of you uh, thriving, succeeding as an investor, um, having a portfolio of microcaps uh, would be actually higher. So with that, um, I've come to the end of my presentation and I would like to thank um, Robert for inviting me to this uh, presentation uh, and I hope you have a great event.